Welcome, everyone, to another episode of What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is the show that is designed to reveal the trends shaping businesses of all sorts today. Whether it be trends in marketing, trends in sales, recruiting, retention, trends in whatever it may be. Our hope is that by uncovering these trends, you're able to discover some things that will make you a little bit better at what it is that you do in your own work, whether that's leading people, serving clients, whatever it may be. Uncovering the trends is our goal. What you're going to hear in this upcoming show today is some information on a furniture retail operation. And before we get into it, I want to say that we pre-recorded this and our intention, or at least when I recorded it, I thought it would air prior to the Christmas break. And uh, unfortunately, as many math teachers in my past would verify, when I did the, the figuring on it, when I calculated when this thing would air, I got it wrong. I got it wrong. And this will be the first show, I think, in the new year, the way we have it scheduled now. So you may hear some references to the upcoming holiday season and things of that nature. Please know that this is not a rerun. This is not from last year. This was recorded in December, just airing in January. When you think retail, when I think retail, and you think uh, small, locally owned operations, what I see more often than not is a hobbyist with a passion for something, whatever that may be, who has decided to take it into the marketplace. So many mom and pop small local stores are people that really have a great passion, a great desire uh, about something very unique, something very narrow and specific, and then want to uh, take that desire to the next level that allows them to get further into it, allows them to essentially get paid to uh, pursue their hobby. What we're going to hear today is from Jeff and Abby Butler. Jeff was with me in the studio and talked about his retail organization operation called La La Land Boutique, focusing on mid-century modern furniture. I did not know, I must admit, what mid-century modern furniture was prior to setting this thing up with Jeff. And then I got online and realized I love this stuff. I didn't know there was a term for it. Jeff, you'll hear, is a great advocate of this style of furniture. And we could go on and on about the uh, about the qualities of this furniture, the 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 inspirations that were going on in our nation at that time that has created the look of this furniture. I think there's a lot of content, and Jeff will admit, you'll hear him admit, that he has great passion around this furniture. But what I think is most notable that really perked my ears up regarding the focus of this show and the trends that shape businesses, et cetera, is his plan to scale the company, his plan to make it much larger than it is. Yes, he is a hobbyist. Yes, he is an expert. Yes, he has a great passion for the furniture that he deals with. But I admire the way that he, a, a local guy, he is going about building this uh, this operation to scale. That he is going about and willingly say, as you'll hear in the upcoming interview, I'm willing to take a little bit less to pay others a little bit more so that this machine really begins working. And frankly, folks, as I look back on my own business for 20 some odd years, that is a decision I have been reluctant to make. So in sitting with Jeff and hearing him talk, particularly about his energy and his passion for scaling this business and trying to help peers and uh, others in our community, young people, perhaps, who have an interest in retail and how to scale it, I got a little uh, excited for him and excited for the thought of his ability to scale and kept applying it to myself. So mid-century modern furniture, if you don't know what it is, if you were to look at some of the pictures of these items, you would probably recognize it immediately. He has two locations. We'll get into that as we come back from break. He's got two locations. And believe it or not, and we've heard this so many times, COVID has been good to him. COVID has been good to him. He pivoted. We've heard that a lot. He pivoted found a new way to bring his uh, products to the marketplace. And in this pivot, his stores, which had been walk-in retail locations, essentially became uh, facilitating locations for taking photos, posting them online, and then getting it out to clients. It's a great story of a guy 
he and his wife that succeeded. When we get back, you'll hear the interview with Jeff Butler on his company, La La Land Boutique Furniture, with operations on the Eastern Shore as well as here in Mobile. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. We'll be right back. My family, Turn to the Experts is more than a tagline. It's a promise. Every Keith technician is an experienced AC professional, and that saves you money. Speaking of money, how about 0% financing for up to 60 months on installations of new carrier systems? Keith and Carrier, Turn to the Experts. Mobile's leading name in comfort since 1964. License number 83731. The best, most cost-efficient ways to talk to customers about who you are and what you do is through signs, simple, effective signs. Hi, I'm Cam Marston, host of What's Working. Signorama is the mobile area's leader in helping you design and build signs advertising your business. What kinds? All kinds of signs. All kinds. Find Signorama on Facebook or at signorama-mobile.com. Think about how people really see you. The kid at the drive-thru just sees a coffee drinker. Please pull forward. Your local barista sees the person who loves a smiley face in their latte. See you next time. It's kind of the same way with insurance. Other insurance companies just see a customer, but a state farm agent sees more. They see you as a neighbor. Your state farm agent is here to get to know who you really are so they can help life go right. Call me, State Farm Agent Allison Horner and Mobile at 666-1616. We're back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. I'm in the studio today with Jeff Butler. He is the owner of La La Land Boutique. They've got two different stores, one on the Eastern Shore, one in Spring Hill here in Mobile. Jeff, welcome to What's Working. Thank you, Cam. We appreciate you uh, inviting us and look forward to the show. When I was pointed out to your store, as a, a mutual friend said, you need to take a look at this. Uh, the emphasis is obviously mid-century modern objects, which seems to be a very narrow niche if you're in the furniture business that would have a very uh, small, narrow customer base. But apparently, people are dying to get their hands on this stuff. Let's start by telling me what it is. It's good stuff, Cam. Uh, so mid-century modern, we're going to say it's 40s, 50s, 60s uh, design, which hence mid-century. Uh, the design was sort of a space age uh, futuristic type design. Uh, these guys were thinking ahead. Uh, and actually, it goes all the way back into the turn of the century. A lot of this stuff was designed in 1919, 1920, that kind of era, and didn't begin production until the 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, and you'll see, you know, it, it falls in line with the architecture. Uh, think the uh, JFK Airport. Um uh, the city, the, you know, Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, all those buildings uh, Oscar Niemeyer did, they are futuristic space age type things. Uh, even so much as that a lot of this furniture was introduced at different world fairs. So, say, 1962 World's Fair, uh, the iconic line Broyhill Brasilia came and, and was displayed. Uh, so it was that cool back then, and it still holds today. It's very clean lines. Uh, these guys were architects. They're they're visionaries. They created this amazing uh, furniture, and you know who wouldn't like to own a piece of furniture that was designed by the same guy that designed, say, the St. Louis Arch, uh, something along that line. Everything has a story, uh, and was very well thought out as far as materials, uh, the design. Um, everything about it was really well thought out, and you just don't see that today. Uh, which is why I think the resurgence in popularity uh, has come about. Every, you know, it, we're all about the green, uh, being green, uh, repurposing, things like that. Well, this stuff is just cool. So you, know, <laughs> you bring it back and, hey, it's cool today as it was 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, and people enjoy it. It's, it's been hot uh, out on the West Coast. I've done a lot of traveling over the past five, six years. 
uh, and it just continues to hang in there. Was it part of a movement? Was it part? Was there a purpose, an, an end game for this stuff? Uh, you know, you go you go all the way back to the Bauhaus movement, way back in the day. You know, that's where the first uh, use of you know Mies van der Rohe put together a chair made out of steel tubing. Uh, got the idea for it from riding a bicycle around the area and thought, man, this bicycle is really strong. Uh, found a steel company that would would bend the steel in the shapes that he wanted uh, and then went and got a plumber buddy of his together. And we're talking 1919. Yeah. So he gets a plumber buddy and they put together the first Wassily chair. It's one of the most iconic chairs uh, in mid-century modern. You see them everywhere. They're in hotels, you know, high-end uh, settings. Uh, and and that's where it came from. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting to note that a lot of these designs, what the furniture companies would do, uh, they would pay these designers. The guys are sitting around. They're making these designs. Uh, and then they would simply patent the design and then put it in the vault. So whether it made it to production or not, you know, who knows? But I do know that, that a lot of these companies still hold patents on some incredible designs that have never been produced. Wow. Um, very, that's got to make, cool you, make you salivate, just wanting to uh, see how that would look. Exactly. That's kind of what we get up for. When did this attract your attention? Uh, actually, all the way back as a kid, man. I was a skateboard kid uh, living in rural areas. My, we were uh, a military government family, moved every two years. So we were in Oklahoma City, Memphis, uh, cities like that. And I got the skateboard bug at a, you know, 9, 10, 11 years old. And I would get these California skateboard magazines, and I'm looking at the pictures, and I see these guys. There'd be a couple shots in somebody's room or somebody's house, and I'm looking, and I'm seeing this cool furniture, and I'm going, man, I want a California room, you know? And <laughs> and my parents were into early American furniture, and so I'm the kid on his bicycle going around picking up mid-century modern pieces out of trash piles, putting them in my room, and my parents are going, man, what is this? And I'm like, this is my stuff. Leave it alone. Yeah. And so... Uh, it, it's had me ever since, uh, even moving up into, uh, I was doing cars and motorcycles for a while. Everything was always pre 65. So it was 45 to 65 has kind of been my sweet spot on things that I like, uh, the atomic era stuff, uh, things like that. And so it was kind of a natural fit, uh, that I just, you know, I think this stuff's cool and needs to continue to have a life. Uh, in somebody else's life. When did you go from being a collector to a seller? I started, uh, interestingly enough, right here in downtown Mobile, I got a booth at uh, Backflash Antiques, which is no longer there, but it was a great uh, antique mall, uh, well-run, well-put-together, very cool, very cool owner. Um, and so I kind of, that's where I got my feet wet, and I set up a little booth, and Man, the, the money was great. I was getting big checks every month, uh, big checks for me, you know, an extra thousand bucks, eight hundred bucks, whatever. Um, and all I had to do was go move stuff around and keep it dusted and go find stuff, which is what I love to do. I love to go buy, uh, love to find this stuff, love the story uh, that I get, love the people. Um, the stories that these people have, you know, hey, this was my grandfather's mm -hmm. desk. I remember him sitting at this for years and years, ever since I was a kid. And so uh, that's the allure to me is the story. Everything's got a story. And, uh, you know, that's the, a big part of it is continuing, is to become a part of that story by acquiring it and fixing it, doing whatever it needs, restoring it and bringing it back to life and then passing it on to another family to love and enjoy for another 50 years yeah. to, you know, continue that story. Can I assume everything I see in your store has been pulled out of a barn, out of a warehouse? You've walked down the street and picked it up off the curb. Does everything have a – has it been discarded or misused prior to you getting it and you're bringing it back to life? A lot of times it has. I find some of the best stuff in some of the worst places you can imagine. Um, Give me an so, example. Uh, you know, I, uh, one of our big hot items is, is the – the cone fireplaces, you know, their mound, preways, whatever, uh, the brightly colored metal fireplaces that are shaped like a cone. Uh, I found them in chicken coops. I found them <laughs> in really, really rough trailer parks. Um, 
you name it. The one I found in, in the chicken coop had been in there for 25 years. It was in the back. Uh, it was a farm. You had the chicken coops, the turkey coops, whatever. And then there was a little room in the very back where they uh, worked on – it was where the tool room or the tools were, where they worked on broken things on the farm. And they had this incredible – uh, pre-way fireplace in mint condition. They'd been burning coal in for 25 years during the winter to keep warm. Um, and the amount of sawdust and dust on it preserved it. Um, and you're talking, you know, these are 15 to $1,700 items. And, and they make a huge step. People build houses around these things. That's, see, this is, this is fantastic to me. And it's so unfamiliar to me that this exists, that there are people with this passion out there. I can't help but wonder, what were you doing in the chicken coop when you looked into the back and said, hey, I'd like your furnace? Well, I, you know, in, in doing the cars and motorcycles, you learn how to pick a barn and you learn to look around the corner. You, you know, you may meet a guy on uh, Craigslist was the big thing back then, um, and the guy's selling a, a transmission you need or whatever, and so he sends you pictures, and the first thing I do is zoom in on the pictures and look in the background. Yeah. You know, what's hanging in the back of the barn? What's that building back there, you know? And then when I get there, uh, it, it's game on. You know, hey, can I look over there? Can I look over here? Can I walk the property? Whatever. Um, and there's no telling what you're going to find out there, especially on in a farm situation, where everything was reused, repurposed. Uh, there was no garbage man that came around and picked stuff up, so they would pile it in a pile on the back 40 or whatever. Um, and so it's just a never-ending supply of stuff out there floating around. And are you still going out collecting these days? Is that You've got two stores now. It would seem to there's some urgency, there's some necessity to continue to gather things and to fill those stores with these items. Absolutely. It's every day. I, it's, it's the biggest part. Um, and with technology, it's a lot easier than it used to be. Um, most everything can be handled through your phone. You got Facebook Marketplace. You, still, you know, Craigslist is still around. You got Let Go. You got all these different apps. Um, but the main thing is is the the uh, the network we've built of other collectors, customers, clients, uh, past sellers that we've bought from, and they know what we're doing and they know what I'm looking for, and so they pretty much it comes to us now. I'm not traveling, you know, uh, my last trip was this past February out in L.A. And coming back through that airport was a really weird experience because it was not, you know, we were right there before the lockdown. Um, so I'm not traveling by plane anymore. Um, so I'm having to either get on the road or work these networks and acquire things. But, yeah, I think, you know. Stuff comes and goes, you know, as fast as I can bring it in, it's going out the door. Let's come back from break and talk a little bit about the customer, about the business model. I know you that your retail is just a, is the tip of the iceberg in the way you're viewing what you're doing today and perhaps some lessons you've learned about creating these businesses and some lessons that somebody's listening around right now thinking, you know, I've got a passion. It might be a particular type of pottery. It might be something else. And I'd love to get deeper into my passion through creating a store and maybe any advice you have on people with that passion. So when we come back, we'll start with the customer and then building a similar type of business. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. I'm in the studio with Jeff Butler. We'll be back after this break. I'm Matt Armbruster with Ransom Ministries. We help people in our community that most others have given up on. Please donate your unwanted electronics to Ransom Recycling. We teach life skills, job readiness, and job creation through our electronic recycling program. We take anything with a cord. Find us at RansomMinistries.com or you can call us at 251-751-0044. Human Resource Department spend countless hours on insurance billing mistakes, Obamacare rules, and compliance. Employee benefits serve the purpose of recruiting, retaining, and rewarding employees. We can handle all of your benefit needs with cost-effective products, employee enrollments, and handle your HR issues. Benefit admin doesn't have to be complicated. My name is Michael Cowart Jr. of the Cowart Group, and we specialize in helping businesses with their employee benefit packages. Visit CowartAssociates.com. We're back. 
back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. I'm in the studio today with Jeff Butler. He and his wife, Abby, are the co-owners of La La Land Modern Vintage Furniture. They specialize in mid-century modern objects. Jeff, before the break, we were talking a little bit about your customer. Who is buying from you? Are you selling mostly to designers or to the end user themselves? Uh, it is a it's a huge mix and a very uh, I love our customers. They are the greatest because they share the passion that we do, uh, and it's everything from young couples just getting married, starting a life, building a home, buying their first home, all the way to seniors who uh, have may have additional pieces that they need uh, some of our pieces to fill some spots. Uh, that they've always been into it, or they're, you know, building a, a, a home, people late in life, building their final home, um, and they just want to do it right. They want to go all the way with it. Pre-COVID, our biggest customer base was movies and designers. Really? Uh, design. We've done a ton of movies. We did the Arkansas movie. We did the uh, Dakota Johnson movie. We've done, we were working on one uh, in New Orleans uh, which I hope they picked back up. It was a Muhammad Ali kind of thing, um, set back in '62. But yeah, we that was. I mean, movies were a big, big part of our do business. Do they rent that furniture or do they buy it? They buy our prices. We we price things to move, um, and so for them coming from L.A., where you know uh, uh, we may have an item on the floor that's twelve hundred dollars. Well, in L.A., it's thirty five hundred dollars. Wow. So they can buy it from us. Uh, and then turn around and, and generally sell it back to us for a fraction of what they paid for it at the end of the movie, um, which was always really a nice gig. No we loved kidding. it. But that kind of dried up a little bit. But the designers still big time. Designers, a uh, huge part of our business. So it's really a mix. It's a little bit of everybody. Everybody can connect, uh, especially in our new store. Our Spring Hill store is more, there's a lot more 70s, 80s. Uh, we keep it authentic. They are actual 70s and 80s designer pieces of furniture and objects. Um, whereas a lot of people my age, I'm 49, they can relate because they saw that stuff. You know, we saw that stuff back in the 70s, 80s. We, you know, if we can remember it, then uh, so there's, you know, the ability for uh, a large group to connect with what we do. It's it's really easy because we run that, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s timeline um, which is, uh, it, you know, the, we can all relate to it. Are you in the nostalgia business? Uh, we are in the, the story business. Oh, you know? that's a great answer, the yeah. story business. And, yes. Uh, so it's the story of each piece. It's right. the story of the designer. Right. It's the story of how this product was conceived, just like you told me about the Bauhaus movement a moment ago and the pipe. Right. Uh, customers come in, you know, every day. Hey, my grandmother had one of those. I remember that. Oh, my God, you know. And, and so there's... Uh, they help build the story. You know, customers come in and say, you know, I remember my dad had one of those and he bought it from here, this furniture store in Bianville Square. They bought it out of the window, this, you know, dining room set or whatever. And that's, you know, true story. We've had that several times. Um, apparently there were some killer furniture stores in downtown Mobile <laughs> back in the day. Back in the day. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's uh, that's interesting. So your store, your customer comes in and has a story to tell and matches their story with the furniture that's on the that they're seeing there. And it's not just furniture. I've looked through your website. There's odds and ends. There's a lot of unique little things in there. Right. We uh, we like to do. You know, we like to be different. We're kind of in antique city, uh, if you will. This area on the Gulf Coast. There's tons of antique stores, and they're all great. They really are. They're great friends of ours. Uh, we love competition, and we don't really look at it as you know competition per se. But um, we do things completely different uh, from everybody else. You know, we picked a niche. We picked a, uh, a, a, an age that we wanted to, to focus on, and we ran with it um, because that's what we love. And so, you know, it, it separates us, and that's what's got, you know, in being this competitive in the antique business, you've got to differentiate yourself. You can't, you know, do the same thing as everybody else. That's a perfect segue into the business model that you've, you've created here. You had the passion, but you, we've talked prior to turning on the mics here that you've got a, 
a, a motivation, a passion beyond mid-century modern furniture. You've got a passion for creating a scalable business. Talk to me about that. Right. That is, you know, what I have learned to actually love is, uh, you know, I didn't have the I wasn't built for college. I did a year at Spring Hill. You know, I got my GED at Murphy, did a year at Spring Hill. It wasn't really for me. Um, and so I've had to figure it out. And I've made a tremendous amount of mistakes and done everything the wrong way. But it taught me uh, I had to learn how to do it the right way. And now I have become fascinated with it. Um, the actual art of business is an art. Um and it's something that I love. I'm just as passionate about business in general as I am in what we do. Um, and I think it, it transpires into the business. You know, just core basic things, uh, having the right team, having your structure, you know, structuring your business from the get go for scalability. Uh, you know, you can operate out of your garage and and kind of fly under the radar and do that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, you can't really scale your garage. You can build a bigger garage, but it's still, you're, you're not in that mentality. You don't have that mentality of business. Um, you, it keeps you small. So what our approach is that, you know, and we shifted a lot during the, the lockdown and whatnot this year, um, to the, to that, you know, let's go back and restructure everything. You know, we came in as a sole proprietor that was kind of cobbled together. Um, and so, you know, we went and we got a good attorney. We got a good accountant. Uh, we got a good banker um, and a mentor. You know, mentor is extraordinarily important. And uh, I happen to find a great one. You know, Pete Bloom, got to give him a shout out. Panini Pete, <laughs> good great Pete. guy, man. He, he has helped me out a lot. Um, and I really look up to him. He, he, I don't know how he manages that, that empire he's built, but he does. Um, but, you know, we came back in. We, we did a, a bunch of modifications to how we did business, how we were structured, and we built it for scale. And I tell you, at the end of the day, when it was all said and done, uh, and we got both, both shops up and running and, and going, uh, brought in a crew. Our crew is incredible. I got, cannot forget, you know, to add that part in. You got to have people to, to, to work for you. And so when all that came to be, it, it, it changed everything. It changed my mentality. I started thinking like a business owner instead of an operator, which was uh, instead of me being in there every day doing this, fixing this, sourcing it, pricing it, selling it, answering questions, answering emails, doing everything I had to give up some control um, and just let things, you know, uh, I'm a big fan of organic business, you know, letting things happen. I don't like to push things. I don't like to be pushy in anything, whether it's a sale or a move, a partnership, anything like that. Things fall into place when you're in the right mindset. And if you've, if you've structured everything properly, then you're in that business owner mentality and things will happen your way, the way you want them to. So retail is notoriously difficult. It's been notoriously difficult in times of COVID when people couldn't get out and they were afraid to get out, whatever it may be. I, I want to touch on a number of the things that you just said. But first, how has the business been in 2020? Have you seen a setback? Are you kind of where you thought you would be? It's like a big old roller coaster at Dollywood. <laughs> um, <laughs> Actually, you know, we we were in Daphne for years. That was our first store. Uh, we had low traffic, low visibility. It was really bad location, but the rent was cheap. Our neighbors were cool. And so we built the business the old-fashioned way, you know, taking, getting people's information, following up with them, treating them well, treating, uh, treating the sellers well, treating everybody well. You know, I come from the uh, Alec Naiman school. I worked with him decades ago, and he taught me how to treat customers. And I have carried the, that to this day. And so I use that same philosophy that, you know, you treat everybody well, no matter what. Um, even if you don't like them, you treat them well. And so uh, when we made the move from Daphne to Fairhope, uh, that was in February. I think we opened February 29th in Fairhope, and we shut down March 11th for COVID. Wow. So you had less than a month. Yeah. open and you shut down for COVID. We did. And so, you know, I took it as, hey, this is an opportunity to go back and let's, you know, that's where the whole restructuring thing came into play. 
So what we did was uh, I took the rest of March and took and went into the store and I took photographs, took measurements, wrote descriptions, and I put everything into an online shopping cart. So we had always used social media uh, you know, and the internet to sell. And I felt like we were doing everything we could. And we might've been on the marketing side, but as far as the selling side, not really, because we had the brick and mortar. So, you know, the goal of social media and online was to get people to come in the door. Well, nobody can come in the door anymore because we're shut down. So we push everything up into a shopping cart. April was the biggest month we have ever had since we've been in business. You're kidding me. Why? It, Why? It, because it turned into, uh, we still push the same, we still use the same strategy for social media. And instead of saying, well, why don't you come in and take a look at it? I would say, well, here's all the details and here's a link to buy it. And so the next response I would get was, hey, I just bought it. When can you deliver it? And so you accelerated the purchase exactly. versus someone coming in and, and looking at it and perhaps sitting in it if it was a chair and trying to decide whether it would fit in their house and it, it, or not. You accelerated the purchase by saying, here are the details, here's the link to buy it. That's exactly what we did. Have you taken this mentality to your interpersonal rea- interactions on the floor now? Or uh, is that only work online? It, uh, you know, that's interesting. We, what we did kind of the little, uh, the nudge was free shipping or free delivery. So, you know, they would buy it and I would deliver it and we do contactless delivery. We were dropping stuff on people's porches, uh, and everything was cool. So, you know, it, it worked in Fairhope, worked in Baldwin County. That was kind of the thing was, you know, if you buy it, I'll, I'll bring it to you for free in Baldwin County, maybe a little bit, 50 bucks or something to come to Mobile. Or, you know, there wasn't much going on. So, it, it, you know, it wasn't anything to drive over to Mobile, sure. make a delivery, and then turn around and try and fill the van up on the way home with new inventory. Ah, efficient. Listen, we need to take a break. We need to go to a, to, to the sponsors here. When we come back from break, I want to pick this up, and I want to st- I want to talk about what I would see as a customer as I walk into one of your two retail locations that is now built to scale. What does it look like? What do you see when you walk into someone else's business to determine if they are built to scale or not? I think this is a, a goldmine of content, and people could learn from this. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. In the studio, Jeff Butler, La La Land, modern vintage furniture operations in both Daphne and Immobile. We'll be right back. This is Cam Marston, host of What's Working. Jim Mitchell and his team at Signorama have provided all types of signage for nearly every event I've been a part of for years. I know his team's creativity, their multitude of products, and how easy they are to work with. His No Mistake Signorama is South Alabama's marketplace leader. Find Signorama on Facebook, call 6340100, or visit next to Mullinex Ford on Airport Boulevard. Think about your home. What do you see? Do you just see two stories or the stories of your toddler's first steps? Now think about your car. Do you see an odometer reading or your kids reading in the back seat? Other insurance companies just see a house. They just see a car. But a State Farm agent sees what your home and your car really mean to you. So why not give them the protection they deserve? You can reach me, State Farm agent Allison Horner, at allisonhorner.com. We're back. I'm Cam Marston. I'm in the studio with Jeff Butler. He and his wife, Abby, are the owners of La La Land Modern Vintage Boutique Store, selling mid-modern furniture. An extraordinary story with remarkable success here, expanding in the times of COVID, folks, which isn't uh, which isn't usual. Jeff, prior to the break, you were delivering materials in Mobile. Then you were filling the van up on the way back for new stuff to sell. You were You were churning at that time when most people are wondering how they're going to make ends meet. Take me through how the storefront was changing at this time. 
at that point, uh, it was pretty much a warehouse, like a little distribution center. So one side of the store was outgoing deliveries. The other side was incoming uh, things that might have needed to be restored, a little fix here, fix there. And I was busy uh, photographing, you know, as fast as I could photograph the stuff. And uh, another thing we were doing was a lot of Facebook Lives, which I think connected with a lot of people, which is just a live broadcast on Facebook. And I was running through some of the big name designers and some of the, you know, the iconic pieces that we had uh, in our inventory and kind of telling the story, um, which I think was really, really essential to the the success of the whole little run. Uh, because it, you know, it connected with the audience. They couldn't connect in the store. They couldn't walk in and talk to me face to face, but I could talk to a bunch of people, uh, online and tell that same story. But yeah, we were just running, you know, wide open every day. It was all, it was deliveries, it was pickups and it just kept going and going in the next, uh, 60 days, 90 days. Uh, it never slowed down. And so that put us, uh, into a situation where we had to scale because we physically didn't have the space to put more stuff in the store. I think we opened back up at the end of May, and we had already started planning the Mobile store over in Spring Hill. And so that's essentially what, you know, our successes in the previous months went right back into getting the Spring Hill store open and and gave us another we've kind of perfected this model of these small spaces so it's like 1200 square feet i think fairhope's 1200 mobiles maybe 1100 and we like that space uh size wise uh it allows us to keep you know to build out vignettes and have you know a really cool looking little space and and at the same time it's not overwhelming and and so it it just works for us and we happen to find that perfect little spot over there and we went for it what does the scale look like what what does it look like from the point of view of me walking into your store or me walking into any store and being able to say oh i can see they've got they've got scaling up in mind here is there something that's physical that someone can recognize or is it more a a mentality I think it's more a mentality. Are the right people, are you, when you walk in, are you being greeted the right way? You can almost tell that, you know, uh, this, this business has got it together. You know what I'm saying? It's, uh, uh, it's hard to describe, you know, I don't know that you could really look and see, but by just the attitude that you're getting and the service that you're getting, uh, which is why it's so important to have the right people in place, you know, which was that was the next step for us was to bring in employees uh, to full time run these things. You know, we have two in Fairhope, two in Spring Hill, and they are they're incredible. Could not do it without them. And so, uh, you know, by learning how to interact with employees, you know, it's all new to me, man. I'm not, you know, uh, from that from that space, but learning how to. Uh, teach people to have the same passion that I have and do things. It's a give and take. You've got to give up some, you know, like I may not like the way, you know, where he put this piece of furniture in here and did this kind of thing. But you know what? At the end of the day, it works and he's doing a great job. And so me as an owner, I have to let go of control. Uh, And that was tough for me. But once I did, it opened up an entirely whole new world for me. Uh, and, and so that's key. You've got to be able, uh, you know, these stores or, you know, we're not out here buying Range Rovers and yachts or anything like that. It's afforded us a a nice living, but at the same time, in order, you know, if we want to take it to the next step, there's got to be, you know, you have to do add on revenue streams. These two streams, they kind of support themselves. It's not cheap running an antique store by any means. I mean, it's really, there's a lot of expenses that you wouldn't even think about that will eat you alive. And then especially bringing in a full crew just takes a huge chunk out of the bottom line. But you have to to ask yourself, am I willing to give up a a piece of the bottom line for more time? Because time is what we really want, what we're really working for. We want more time to spend with our family, to do other things we love, things like that. And by building this thing uh, to scale in that direction, 
uh, I'm happy to give away a piece of the bottom line if it allows me more time to go pursue other things, to look for other other streams to add to this portfolio of businesses. So I hear in your voice a lot of passion, passion for the product, passion for the the segment of the American history the, that this furniture was created in, passion for the people and the and the ideas which create it. I'm also hearing a lot of passion in uh, running the business. This 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 attitude you've gained on how to scale this. You you see things differently now. This is not a job. It's a business. This is not a hobby. It's a business. So here's a question. This is a left field question. Is this what you were meant to do? I hope so, because I love it, you know. So I, I would say, yeah. Uh, I Again, I come from the school of hard knocks, man. And to be able to have, number one, stayed out of trouble enough to make it to this point is, to me, is like, man, I got to do this now, you know. And and so now my, my passion is shifting more towards, you know, helping other business owners or other entrepreneurs who are maybe thinking about getting into business uh, especially kind of, you know, at risk type youth things, you know, I've probably done the same stupid things they've done, except I didn't get caught as often as they did. And so I would love to help that kid out that, you know, he may be 20, 22 years, I have a 22 year old son and, and he's got the bug. Um, but, you know, having all his friends in the house and seeing where they've ended up uh, over the years, uh, you know, they come to me and ask questions. And so I kind of mentor them. Uh, and I would love to help them not make the same mistakes that I made in business and kind of help guide them down the path of, uh, you know, uh, being an independent business owner themselves. So what I'm hearing is a similar story that I've heard with Vision Healthcare, I think it was, or Victory Healthcare, one of those. Another one with Ty Bullard and his, uh, his family's car business. And this, this business, they've all said is a place for me to express my values. And the business is the front for what's important to me. What's important to you, Jeff, is helping these at-risk youth, and you're learning through the process of ways to do that. Is that fair? I That's the direction I want to go in. So, and, and you know, and these kids are smart these days, and they'll see right through your BS, man. If you're not, show, if you're not doing it and they can't see it, then they're not going to respect you. And so uh, I've had to learn, you know, especially having employees, clear and concise communication um, is so key. Uh, you've got to tell people what you want them to do if you want them to do it. If you get wishy-washy and you get kind of, uh, you know, unsure of yourself, they see it, you know, and they smell it and they lose respect for you and they will not follow your lead. Can you give me an example of a time where this uh, this came clear to you? You know, the clear, concise communication where you uh, you, you, you realized, you know what, I didn't say that correctly. And I look at what I got. Here's what I need to do differently. I've spent 20 years in corporate America before this. So I've seen it for 20 years. OK. Um, and, and it's just a. It's not, you know, necessarily a, a, a fault of anybody's, but it's just, uh, you know, it's so much more easier to to just deal with whatever situation it is. Make the decision, stand by your decision, do it. If it's right or wrong, accept responsibility for it. If it's right, it's best to distribute the, the uh, you know, the rightness throughout the whole team. Hey, we did it. If you're wrong, you got to suck it up and take responsibility for it. I was wrong. The team was right. That's kind of my mentality um, because I see it as, you know, I'm calling the shots. I got to stand by it and I've, and I've got to take responsibility, whether, you know, especially for the bad. Um, and that's how you keep your people uh, loyal to you and motivated. You know, they feel like I, I think that all of our employees have feel like they have an ownership part in this thing we've created. Um, we encourage them to bring items in, to uh, expand on, you know, different things that they're interested in. Hey, here's a platform. There's a bunch of people coming in here every day that you can talk to. Um, and why don't you, you know, feel free to expand on your goals and your dreams and visions. Let me help you because, you know, nobody was there to help me, but I want to help you. So... What is one thing, we're going to wrap it up, what is one thing that you've learned about yourself 
in this process? Um, I have, you know, I think my buddy Pete, uh, a different Peter uh, Anderson from Belrose. They were our Belrose tattoo was a neighbor of ours for the first two years we were open. And he said to me one day that he admired my stick wittedness. <laughs> so I've always kept that in my head, and I'm like, okay, I got stick wittedness. I am hard headed, and and uh, you know I am driven, man. And that's just kind of my thing. Uh, and again, if you send me in the right way and kind of help me out a little bit, man, I will keep on plowing through for right or wrong. Uh, and, and I've done it wrong enough to know that now I'm a little more selective in what I plow through. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, uh, you know, I've become a better listener, uh, and, and a little more cautious. And, uh, you know, I, I see that, you know, I'm beginning to get to that age. Like I said, I'm 49, and so I'm starting to think, you know, how many more years do I have left? I need to go ahead and kind of get things, you know, in a direction to where I'm kind of able to wrap it up at the end of the show. When I'm, you know, when my show's up, I don't want to have a, you know, I see so many estates and I talk to so many families, and they're left with, you know, these incredible, uh, you know, I'll just say an incredible mess. And I don't want to leave that. I I don't want to leave this planet and leave that for my kids. I want to leave them something that they can be proud of and they can continue to to operate with the same uh, passion that I did. And whether it's in any sort, you know, hey, they might want to sell the business and buy some real estate. I think that's great. You know, there's there's an irony here. You're making a mid-century decision right now (laughs) at 49 years old. You're very into mid-century furniture. There's a theme. There's a thread running through this. That's excellent. There's somebody out there that wants to know where to find you. Tell them where your stores are. So we are in uh, Fairhope at uh, 138 Baldwin Square. That's the Winn-Dixie Shopping Center. We are opposite Planet Fitness. It's off of uh, uh, 98 Greeno. We're between Fairhope Avenue and Morphe Avenue in that shopping center, Winn-Dixie. Um, in Mobile, we are in Spring Hill at 4456 Old Shell Road. That is that is next door to Pullman's Bakery. Oh, sure. Um, so right there in the heart of Spring Hill. Uh, right now, we're doing 11 to 4, uh, Tuesday through Saturday, and we are doing extended hours Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday until 6.30 at both stores through the month of December. Christmas season. It's so, time. It's time. It's rain. It's, I was about to say it's, it's, it's haymaking season for you, but it sounds like COVID was the haymaking season for you, which is going to make a lot of retailers out there going, man, he's it, killing it. Uh, it's, you know, we're just... Man, we just stick and move, stick and move. Jeff, thank you very much. Folks, Jeff Butler, he and his wife, Abby, run La La Land Modern and Vintage Furniture, both in Spring Hill and, uh, is it? the Fairhope. Fairhope. Darn, Fairhope. Uh, we'll be back with final comments. Do you sometimes wonder about different money topics, but struggle to find the answers? The Every Dollar Counts podcast with Gulf Coast experts Josh Knoll and Jay Stubbs is made for those folks serious about their financial plan and looking for answers. Josh and Jay dedicate their time to explaining the various services and products available, as well as discussing lifestyle and money interests of the modern day family. Tune in to Every Dollar Counts on Apple Podcasts and everywhere else you get your favorite podcasts. Hi, I'm Cam Marston, host of What's Working. My carrier Infinity system is quiet, energy efficient, and runs like a dream. To keep it running smoothly, I rely on a maintenance plan from Keith Air Conditioning. With a Keith maintenance plan, your home or business receives discounts and 24-7 priority service. Give Keith Air Conditioning a call today at 251-476-3610 or visit keithair.com. Keith and Carrier, turn to the experts. Special thanks to Jeff for coming into the studio. Special thanks to him for being as patient as he was, explaining what mid-century modern furniture is. I really got a a fascination for it, and I have to admit that after my conversation with Jeff the very same day, I went into their Spring Hill location and looked around and saw some stuff with a new appreciation for it. And, uh, well... 
I won't know, but some of that may have been under the Christmas tree for me as I got home and said, you know what I just saw? I really like this stuff. It's kind of cool now that I know a little bit about it. Uh, so I, I want to emphasize again his passion towards scaling the business, number one, as well as number two, helping some folks out. I, you got to admire people who were really gracious to their mentors and the people that have led them and guided them and given them some great advice and guidance. And, I'm, and I, I like that about people who are willing to make sure that those that were very helpful to them get acknowledged in some way or another. So folks, just FYI, something to recognize is this is the first episode of the new year. Uh, we're now in our third year of what's working with Cam Marston. It's been a heck of a ride. I feel like the show continues to get refined and a little bit better and a little bit better. We continue to get referrals from people on businesses that we need to interview and people we need to meet in our location here. The spread of the podcast version of this show, and I'll tell you how to get that, continues to grow into communities around here, around Mobile, as well as to places all over. It's uh, it's interesting when sometimes we'll get a guest with kind of a, a national, international following. He or she will post this interview, my interview with them, and we get downloads from Iceland and we get downloads from Tasmania and things like that. It's really, it's really not something that I thought that I would see. Um, so if you want to listen to this show as a podcast, if you want to subscribe to the show as a podcast, go to What's Working with Cam Marston online. Or I think actually I, I gave you the address wrong. What's Working Cam.com. Again, What's Working Cam.com. Or go to where you find your favorite podcast and enter What's Working with Cam Marston and you can find this show. If you do it at Apple iTunes, please rate the show. It's always very helpful. Apple pays a close attention to those things. It helps our rankings. So please rate the show and um, always eager for your feedback as well. If you've got a guest, somebody in locally or not locally that has a unique angle on the trends shaping business today that you feel would make a good guest, we'd sure like to hear about them. It's nice to get these introductions. Email me, cam, C-A-M, at cammarston.com. Cam, C-A-M, at cammarston.com. And we will chase this person down and determine if their content would be a good fit for the show. We are also continue to promote the show on social media. Find us at Cam Marston at, uh, on Facebook. We are trying to merge all these different Facebook pages into one, and we're merging them into Cam Marston. And you'll find the same on Instagram and on Twitter. Those There's some other dude named Cam Marston out there who has an inactive Twitter account and won't let go of it. That's the show for this week. John Thompson is the show's producer. He's with Ion Digital. We'll have another show next week. Have a good week, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.